Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming in. I know it's uh, it's a bit hard, so I was prepared that some of you at least made it. That's great. And um, it's, I'm very happy and honored to be here. It's um, our new museum, and it's obviously in my direction and my research field, so I'm very interested to uh, also look at this museum myself and um, more. And uh, maybe this is a good way to introduce a little bit what I do here at UBC. And um, before I start, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about green skins and what that is. But um, just today, actually, the specialists in the water field are congregating in Stockholm to discuss water because um, what is happening in the world at the moment is because of the densification in the world of the cities and everybody moving into the cities, a lot of people are actually, um, there's a big concern. The concern is getting bigger that we don't have enough water for actually feeding these people, and particularly in cities. Um, where the water supply is already sparse. So my research feeds in into that field at the other end. I'm looking at capturing rainwater and reusing it in the same way as drinking water and so on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. That's about half an hour. Tanis told me about half an hour, and I give you a little spiel here what I'm going to talk about. These are the sort of subjects I'm just going to introduce it a bit and then I talk about specifically about the different kinds of systems we can actually use and apply in architecture and in cities um, to, to actually capture water and reuse it. And my specific research area in that field is stormwater mitigation. So not only using them to capture rainwater, but actually reducing the stormwater, the speed. I will talk about that a bit later. And then I will also, uh, Tanis asked me to talk a little bit about this building, because in this building we also have a water collection system. And I phoned the architects and the landscape architects, and they gave me some details of this building. So I will show you that, and then also do a little conclusion about the lecture. When we talk about green skins, and this is really interesting, normally I talk anywhere else apart from Vancouver, so it's uh, interesting for me to talk on home turf and, and show you the images of Vancouver here. There are two images showing Vancouver 1991 and 2006, and you can see um, an increase in, uh, of population even already, if you look at these two diagrams here already, that they, because of the population growth we have uh, much more urban sprawl, and <clears throat> a lot of the land is uh, covered up by urban areas. So we have, because of this issue, we have many uh, concerns concerning with um, the actual <clears throat> imperviousness of the surfaces. I will talk about this in my next slide. So um, I just bring this up as a bit of a theory. Um, if you look at Manhattan, the city of Manhattan in 1609 to 2009, what I think is a really big issue is the concern how we densify and take existing land and then create these massive cities. And the impact in the world is obviously huge. And the loss of vegetation is something we or my lab is trying to research to reintroduce vegetation into the cities in a new way using these green skins I'm going to talk about. So this Manhattan project which was created in, in, in New York, talks about that. And I thought this image is sort of really exemplifies a little bit what I'm trying to do. And uh, I will show you methods we can introduce to actually get um, the stormwater and the other benefits green roofs and green skins and green walls have as a whole. And I will show you those different aspects right now. Now, because of the increase of the impervious surfaces in cities because of the densification. These are the three aspects, we, the three problems we then occur. First of all, sewage overflow, then flooding, and the degradation of the water quality. If you look at the bottom here, you see this hydrological water cycle diagram. This is a healthy hydrological water cycle. When we come in and start paving this area up, build, putting buildings in, that natural cycle is interrupted, and we will have these kinds of effects. And these are some examples from around the world at a very disastrous scale, but these are increasing because of the climate change. So with this in mind, we need to find tools in the cities to actually um, alleviate that problem. And uh, green skins are, uh, are one way to actually do that. The other thing um, which happens when you densify cities is the, uh, the urban heat island effect. 
and I brought you these two little diagrams here showing that. This is Manhattan here, and the two uh, diagrams show it in two ways. The bottom one shows the vegetation, so all the dark green areas are the vegetated areas. This is Central Park, and the top is the temperature, so all the, the bluer the color is lower the temperature. That means if you have vegetation in the cities, it will actually improve the cooling effect of the city. So we need to do anything <clears throat> on to, to actually improve that situation to make these cities feeling more comfortable. So funny enough, the most sustainable city in North America is Manhattan. Not because of the buildings being of high quality, but because of the density. So because everything, all the services are very close together, it's actually the most sustainable city. And then one way to actually alleviate <clears throat> the sort of heating up of the city is putting in parks and vegetation. So this is one example. So when I put down my ideas and theories about how I see these green skins work, I look at three systems. So I see them holistically, so that's why I show you this diagram. So you have the green roof, you have the green facade, and you have the ground plane. So when we talk about these skins, you have to look at the holistic system as a whole. And these are some of the list here shows you some of the different benefits these different systems have. And what you can do is you can apply them all together or add maybe one or two or just have one. It depends on the situation where you are actually putting architecture in place. So this is diagram is just showing the different kinds of benefits these green roofs have in, and green facades. What I'm going to do now briefly is just go into the different systems just to give you a bit of an understanding and I'll show you examples of it for my own work and for my colleagues just to give an understanding what these systems actually aesthetically look like. It was developed in Germany about 40 years ago as a retrofitting system on existing buildings to reduce the stormwater and also to develop systems, particularly when they were creating the downtown cores on parking areas. Vancouver has the same problem, downtown, many parking areas. Underneath, above these, underneath these parks are always garages. And on top, even at ground level, is gardens. But they are actually, technically speaking, roofs. We have two types, the extensive and the intensive. <clears throat> intensive, or as it, it says it, is it has maintenance. You can have trees and big plants. And extensive is just a layer of a very thin grass layer or sedum layer. These are very thin plants which can uh, sort of resist very hard conditions. You can, I'm sure, see them here in this uh, museum, actually. <clears throat> so you have these two systems. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into it technically too much. But the one system, you can act like a gardener. You can go in there and dig, dig the ground. And there, you shouldn't. It's more like a really thin skin. And um, these two systems can, and what that looks like, <clears throat> looks a bit like this. <clears throat> so this one on the right, on the right here is an intensive green roof. It can be used as a garden. This is in Berlin, one of my projects with one of my mentors. Um, it's a bank, very famous bank. And in their courtyard at lunchtime, they can sit in this garden. Underneath is a garage. So technically speaking, it's, a, it's not nature, nothing to do. It's basically a flower pot. And on the left here, we have an extensive green roof. This is a herbal roof. Um, that's a retrofit roof in Berlin. And um, <clears throat> using different herbs and natural grasses. So these are the two kinds of green roof systems at the, its basic level. And then I dive right to, into it to show you what we use these for. This is um, in Switzerland by uh, an architect called Peter Zumthor. He won the Pritzker Prize last year, the most biggest prize we have worldwide for architecture. And he integrated this thermal bath in this very remote Swiss Valley with a green roof, aesthetically integrated into this very sensitive area. So the, the, he not only looked at the other benefits of this green roof, but in this case, it was also the integration aesthetically. So it has many different tasks. And you, it, it depends how you apply it and when it is what, whatever the function of this kind of green roof is. And I'm going to talk about that later on. But these are just some images to show how this also changes over the season. <clears throat> so in autumn, and you see it in spring here. So you get these different atmospheres just to see how um, a green roof like that works. These are some more of my own works. It just shows you, you can even build hard landscape on it. You can put water on it, but technically it's a green roof. 
and uh, then the hedges or this one here this is the german government the new governmental buildings in berlin a colleague of mine she did that and just shows you when you think it's actually a piece of ground it isn't because underneath it technically speaking is a garage space now when we think about the benefits of the green roof i highlighted three major areas and underneath are all the other important parts but the major areas are increase of the vegetation area and with that you can see that here because of the increase of the vegetation area you have more photosynthesis uh, co2 exchange to o2 and so on the other thing is it extends the lifetime of a roof so it has a protective value for the roof flat roof uh, leaky condo <clears throat> here in vancouver big problem it's actually, this is a much better system. If it's uh, applied properly, it works really well to inter introduce um, this kind of system to protect the roof. And the third, which is my major area, is the stormwater control. Uh, and the thickness of the roof will determine how much runoff from that roof you have to either use for toilet flushing, for irrigating your garden, for um, cleaning it up to drinking water quality. There are many different things you can do with it. But these are just the sort of different systems in application. <clears throat> I, I worked for nearly 10 years on the Potsdamer Platz, which is the area which was sort of dividing East and West Berlin. So the former wall went along here, and this was the East, and the other side was the, the West. And after the unification process, this area was filled in. And I was in charge of this big site, which was designed by Renzo Piano. It's the master planner. It's a very famous Italian architect. And we were only allowed to build this project to introduce green roofs. Because they were worried, the city was worried, if we build something like that, where's the sewage going? Because the sewage system in Berlin is 150 years old, so if we come <clears throat> with a big concrete area, concrete everything over, it gives a big rain event, we're going to have some serious problems in the sewage system. So we had to, or we were called in, we had to find a way to mitigate that problem. So this is the aerial view of the thing built, 17 buildings, and two types of green roof systems, the gardens, and then on top you see the extensive green roofs which are um, sort of in combination <clears throat> built together. And the ones on the top are there to collect the water. And then you use the water to irrigate the gardens in the middle and also to irrigate, or better said, to feed. There's an artificial lake to feed this lake, which is part of the architectural design concept. And the most interesting part about it, in that plaza area in the middle there, up there, is a cleansing system underneath, <clears throat> which cleans that water which we collect before we reuse it to drinking water quality. And this was already 15 years ago. So this is nothing new. Um, we are not inventing the real new. So we should really start applying these systems uh, everywhere in the world. And these are some shots of this area from aerial shots of the extensive green roof and then of the actual <clears throat> gardens themselves. So this everything is actually possible, but you have to always make decisions for what it is. Is it a functional thing like the sculptural garden? Is it a restaurant area? And what are the major tasks of this? Is it just an aesthetical space, aesthetically pleasing space, or is it also catching rainwater? All these spaces I'm showing you apart from the first one, these are all recreational spaces while the first one is really collecting the water. These are some more shots of the different ones, even play areas. And I took lots of guided tours and so on. And you can see here also the, the building is designed. This is a building by Richard Rogers, also a very known British architect who did the Lloyds building, for example, in London. And how the vegetation is integrated as part of the whole system into the building. And that not only gives shade, but like it cleans the air and it also captures rainwater. So it has many, many different functions, as I mentioned to you briefly before. I'm not going to go too much into this, but I did a lot of research, and that's why I got interested in this field 15 years ago on the different kinds of soils, because this water, when it comes on the roof through the soils, obviously charges with minerals. And some minerals you want and some you don't because they can make the algae grow ex intensively and that's not what you want if you want to drink the water or use it for something else. So we tried to develop systems using volcanic materials uh, uh, from the vol yeah, volcanoes. So 
uh, inert materials, which are not organic, to uh, create a soil where these little plants can actually grow in. And the vegetation, the actual organic matter they get through when the plants die, from that material, when they die, they can actually, with that, they get the nutrients. So it's actually a process which works. And so we've developed a lot of um, research on that. Just a, a quick um, look into Canada, because what I, when I talk about the research I do, I specifically trying to determine where is the best way to apply green roofs, green facades. I'm going to talk in a minute about and how do you apply them. And now with all the problematic weather conditions we have, we have to really understand each city specifically and see is this the right thing to apply to this city. So I looked at St. John's and I looked at Vancouver, which have very similar rain patterns. The only difference is, and we can experience this today in Vancouver, it doesn't rain at all in summer, or very little. In St. John's, it rains all the year moderately. So the, the question is, where do you apply then a green roof or green facade in relation? So I looked at all these weather data. I'm not going to go too much into detail here. But you can already see on this little graph, very simple graph, the blue is the rain pattern. It just shows you it's quite gradual. And when if I switch it to the one in Vancouver, this is the summer. And then when I switch it to the one in Vancouver, in summer, zero. And this is exactly the problem. And how, how can we deal then, how can we deal then applying these systems? So my critique about these systems is we have to be really careful when to use those systems. When is it really sens sensible to actually use them? Uh, and that's why I made this sort of little um, chart here saying, what for me personally is the best green roof system. And that's why I wrote that in, in red at the bottom. It has many benefits, but we need to have one benefit to actually entice people with this subject. And that is the stormwater. And the reason is, you as taxpayers don't know this. Most of your tax goes to the military. And it goes to things above ground. But 30 to 40% of your tax is below ground. And that's where it goes, into stormwater. So, this is maybe a way, if, and I'll show you systems which are much cheaper and which would alleviate a lot of taxes, that people would listen to this more, that we could spend less tax on these systems to actually get rid of the stormwater and you reuse it in the cities instead of channeling it, what we do at the moment in Vancouver into the sea. So um, these are just some other two more graphs and then I'm done with graphs. Just to show you St. John's in comparison you see these two graphs here. That's the only area, the only time in the year where they need a little bit of irrigation. If you look at Vancouver, this is a big problem. You need a lot of irrigation. This means all the green roofs downtown in Vancouver, and I want to do a study, I want to get a student out there and do a study, they are using drinking water for that. And that's not appropriate. We shouldn't be using our drinking water for that. So when we create these sustainable systems, we shouldn't be using the drinking water. So I made this little uh, diagram, uh, sort of explanation here, and I made a diagram that makes it easier for you maybe to understand. So the difference between these two places, although the rain pattern is very similar, to actually make this sustainable in Vancouver, you would need this cistern to actually get this thing on the ground. Or you need to take drinking water, which is not what I would be doing, because then it's not a sustainable system, system then it's an add-on system. But in, here in St. John's, you wouldn't need anything. So what I'm trying to say with that is, <clears throat> when, we when we use these sustainable systems, we need to really understand, and really go into detail before we actually apply them. The next thing I just briefly want to talk about is green facades. And the research there has been very weak, and it's a colleague of mine is starting on it. And there is another colleague here at the BCIT uh, college or, um, where they are doing research on that. So this is an ongoing process. Basically what it does, it increases the vegetative area because obviously green roof is only one little area while the facades of a building, there are four. So there's much impact this would have on, uh, on, the <clears throat> on actually benefits it would have for cleansing the air stormwater mitigation and so on. And I just brought you some diagrams there. So they, these are systems which are stuck onto the wall. They're separate. And the reason why they have to be separate is so that the water doesn't enter the building. And there are different kinds of systems, and I made these little diagrams showing them. So these are sort of climbing plants, or the first one 
was a, a, a system, we can see that at Vancouver Airport, when you get out of the airport and you see the car park, these are en elements which are sort of screwed to the wall and they're filled with plants and they're sort of pre-grown and that's a very, so there are different types of system. There's a lot of research currently going on in the aesthetics, stormwater and also air cleaning. So for example, this one is a double facading system where you have the car park behind, you can barely see the cars on the right. And then they put this climbing structure there, not only aesthetically to cover the car park, but also to improve, obviously, uh, the um, heat island effect in the city. So anything we can do to integrate, like here, another example, uh, vegetation in the city will help to um, diffuse uh, the problems we have when we densify the cities more. And these are all the systems together and gives you a bit of an understanding. Uh, and that's where a lot of research has currently been done. The rain, which hits that facade could also be taken up by the leaves of these plants. So it can actually help to reduce the stormwater runoff. And the research is still going on. And you can see here, if you have a little strip of greenery on the street, that's not very effective. But if you have the whole facade for cooling and vapor transpiration, you get a much better condition of the actual air. The same thing. When you, when you apply these systems, you have to think about how do they actually function. So you need somewhere to get your water. And you can either collect it from the roofs. So what I'm trying to say with that is, or you need to collect it from somewhere else and from another cistern. But you should collect it in such a way, so if you need a pumping system, it should be solar driven. So it is a sustainable system. Otherwise, again, it's an add-on and not really what we are looking for. I, I just show you one little bit of research, what we do in the lab, and just a really tiny area, and I made it very simple for you to understand. The idea, what I looked for, I went downtown uh, in Vancouver, and I took one hectare area site, and we, we, we did a lot of studies, but i just show you one really basic study. We looked at the green versus gray areas, and we came up and we calculated all the facades, all the roofs, all the concrete areas, 88% of the downtown average, of the downtown is all impervious surface, only 12% is pervious. What implications has that on, and this is the sort of calculation, and what implications, so this is also the location where it is, and what implications does this have on the actual stormwater? What, what does that mean, what, what that area, so when you have that area? So what we did was we run programs to look how much stormwater is actually coming out of this one hectare in the downtown core of Vancouver. And to put this into perspective and scale, um, so we calculated all the areas and, we and then we came up with all the cubic meters of water a year just to show you um, how much that is. But to put that into perspective for you, as people not familiar with this, these are all the roof areas, 20 American football field scale, that's the size we measured. And that produces 22 Olympic-sized swimming pools of stormwater, just that one hectare in the downtown. So where the hell are we putting all that water? What we're doing with it now, we're channeling it into the sea and then making drinking water out of it. We need to have lots of energy because desalination, et cetera, et cetera. So totally crazy. That's what we do every day in Vancouver. And that's just one hectare. So you can imagine with the sprawl of the city by 2036, Vancouver will have 3 million people. In 1950, we were 50,000. So because of this increase, and we can see now with all the unrest in the world, this is going to get more. We're going to have serious problems. And we need to think of ways to mitigate those problems and tackle them now in a positive way and not, you know, panic about it, but find solutions. So my solution is put on these green skins. And I made this little graphic solution here with the facades urban agriculture, you're on the top of the roofs, gardens, whatever. That won't work everywhere, and it's not going to help everything, but it will at least improve the situation. And that brings me to my fifth point. Is stormwater an urgent international concern? I speak about this field a lot abroad, so it's a pleasure to actually do it in a city where it really rains a lot. Um, and so it is. And, we, and what it happens, the effect it has, is that it produces things like this, the flood in Pakistan. It produces images like that. You know, particularly in the third world or in countries which are um, on the way to get in, like, 
India or China were on the way to get economic powers, these problems are detrimental. So the, the systems that I've tried to develop are systems to help to avoid exactly this kind of problem here with the food distribution, famine, etc. when it comes to these disastrous scales. When we look at this population growth, increase of urban space, and then obviously increase of imperviousness of the surface, increase of stormwater, what can we do to mitigate those problems? I've shown you green roofs, and I've shown you green walls or green facades. What can we do to actually avoid this kind of thing? The problem is, and it's really cheap, it's actually simple, but we just need to all ingrain it. What we do at home, uh, I've listed it up here, Normally, the runoff of the building goes right into your stormwater sewer. Your park driveway is mostly impervious. The water goes right into the sewer. When you build a new building, you strip, so uh, you, you, you build the building, the soil is completely compacted. You put on a little bit of soil, and then the, your whole area won't drain. So there's lots of these aspects, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. So. What can we do to actually alleviate that problem? To look at the diagram, this is the typical Vancouver sewage system. It just toilet, so you get different classification of waters, gray water, black water, etc. It all goes into one system. It's treated up into the sea and into the rivers. The problem is that the treatment plants here are so bad uh, that there isn't, they, they kill all the diseases but they, the solids are not reduced, fine filtered, which is stage three of a treatment plant. So what happens, that material goes into the rivers and reduces the O2 level of the rivers and makes the rivers and the sea, particularly around Vancouver, not a very pleasant place to be, and it reduces the fish life, etc. But this is the normal traditional system. Now, some cities are starting to separate so that we put the stormwater directly and we treat the black water from the toilets, etc. The problem with this one is this comes with such a speed when there's a storm that it flushes out all the good life in the rivers and in the sea. So this is also not the right appropriate approach. So um, there are systems, and I listed them here, and I show you a little couple of little diagrams and photos how they look. These are systems which we can then integrate at the ground level. So we've talked about the roof, we've talked about the facade, and then we can talk about the ground level. These are systems we can actually introduce to actually mitigate those problems. This is a list of these, and I show you images. So my dream concept would be this. We have the green roofs, we have the green facades, and then we percolate the water directly at its source. This is what we need to achieve. And when we have a really bad rain, the water then can run as a storm overflow, but only under really serious conditions. And with all these different tools I will show you, and the green roofs and the green walls, most of the water will stay on your piece of property. And we won't need to upgrade the sewage system, which is going to happen in the next 10, 15 years in Vancouver, which is going to cost billions to do because we're just running out. Portland had the same problem. What did they do? They introduced all these systems. That's where they're coming from, and I take the students every year. So this is a little um, diagram here on the right of a bioswale, and for you as laymen, some images how that looks. They're different kinds of systems. So the rain from the surfaces go into the system. It is the speed of the water is reduced. The water can drain into it, or it can be channeled somewhere else, and then it can drain there. But it's actually happening at the source. That's two, one system we need to introduce. This we can introduce in a place like Richmond. When we are downtown, we can obviously also introduce systems. They're called rain gardens. So they are attractive systems. This is in Los Angeles, adjacent, architecturally integrated systems to actually produce the same thing. So they could be aesthetically integrated. Or um, this system here in uh, Seattle, a seating area uh, in a housing area, just adjacent to the paved area, you have the seats, the water runs underneath, and then it gets percolated directly into the ground and it's recharging the aquifers and it's improving this, the condition of the water situation. Or at uh, Portland University, where this system is integrated as a holistic system. So um, this year I'm taking the students to Portland so they will see this. So you have a, the roof, the water is down 
goes down the, the drain pipe, then goes over the plaza so the students interact with it, goes into a rain garden and then into a cistern and then that water is used for toilet flushing and cooling the building. So it's an educational tool and you can see it here in a diagram. And then the water um, is then reused. So these systems exist and we should really introduce them to all the buildings. And um, so the rainwater harvesting is an important part. Now we'll talk about this in the BD in a minute. But this is just one aspect you need to consider. So this capturing of the water and then the use for all these different things which I've listed here from drinking water to irrigation and they obviously the different kinds of treatment these cisterns need that will help them to actually create that harvesting method. And then there are different systems. You can just use the normal rain barrel at home and have a a whole row of them, or you have a more sophisticated system. In the end of the day, both systems work. That's the way how you should start capturing the water. The, the other thing is you can obviously, as I mentioned before, on the green roofs, you can capture it on the green roofs. And I have an image here just to, re, to, to remind you on that. These are two really cool roofs. The one here is at the research labs in Germany. And the interesting thing is it integrates also solar, so it produces power and it re and it captures the stormwater. And this is in Toronto, uh, a more aesthetically pleasing. But so the combination, you can see what I'm trying to get at. There's a combination. It always depends where it also is, what we can do. And then for your garage driveway, you should switch to pervious paving. So you can get rid of about 20 to 30% of the water on site. And then the other good thing is, and this is an example from Portland and from China in the Pearl District, the water from the green roofs and the surfaces around it is collected in a park, but this park is not just a park, it's also a water retention area where the water is cleansed and cleaned and then reused. So it can be integrated in the recreation and landscape architects, my profession, that's what they should be doing. And then finally, a typical Vancouver neighborhood at the top, ridiculous. Mowing, fertilizing, irrigating, crazy. Taxpayers' money. And also the machinery. CO2 production with the lawnmower. I see them doing this now all the time. Why not use plants which need very little maintenance, which need very little um, the hardy plants for this condition, so it depends where it is, obviously, but you can actually apply these plants. And the surface of the vegetation is much bigger, so it actually produces a much better inner city climate. So an important aspect to consider. And it's very simple things how we could improve the situation. I was asked to briefly talk about, and I have five, six slides finally before I conclude, about the BD Museum where we're sitting in. Now the BD Museum was developed, uh, designed by Pat Cow Architects. One of uh, their, 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 it's a couple, John Patkow uh, <clears throat> uh, sent me those, uh, kindly those slides. And um, they, the concept of this building is that it also starts to capture rainwater and reuse it. And I will show you some of the parts of it. And the uniqueness of this is, and they did this together with PFS, Philips, Farnfork, Farnfork and Smolenberg. They're very famous landscape architects. Actually, I would say that one of the most known landscape architects in Canada, they, they're here in Vancouver, they did this together. What the great thing is when you go home today, you have a look outside, is this integration of good design and technicality of introducing these water collection areas together. When I made these photos, just show this really well. So this is the green roof we under here, and the water from the green roof is collected in this channel. So is the water from these other roofs. And then the concept finally is at the end, and I will show you the images for it, that water then goes into a drainage pond and is percolated on site. At the moment, that is not yet completed, but that's the final concept. What the really good thing about this is the subtlety, this technical part is not just an aesthetic add-on, but it's also a beautiful part of this project. Just imagine the site, just the concrete wall. So the combination of integrating 
rainwater collection and architecture, I think, is, is really good. And the great thing is you can also see the seasons. This thing will get brown in a few weeks. And then it obviously it's winter. We will have snow on it. And then in, in spring it starts. So it introduces also this aesthetic value with it. These are this the other direction. And very subtle. So the downpipe of the green, which is just just out here, so when you get out of the building, you can see it. The downpipe drips right into this channel, and the water is then channeled right down to the lower end, where in the end, and I have sketches of that, the, the project will end. So in this area, at the final end, there will be a lake, hopefully soon, where this water can then percolate into the ground. And this should be standard with each building. This is the plan of it. We are underneath here. This is the green roof. So there's the canal going, and this is the lake at the bottom. And I show you an image of that here. So you can see how that is actually working, the system. So the water is collected from the roofs and the, from all, the normal, normal roof and also the green roof. And then it's meant to be channeled into the stormwater um, pond at the end. And that then will recharge the aquifers of the groundwater table here. And the water, the rainwater, will be charged going through the soil with minerals. So it will be a much better water quality. If you were on a ship and would be drinking rainwater collected from the air, from the sky, for more than a, maybe two or three months, you would die because there's no minerals in it. So that is a really important process of the water. It needs to go through actually soil to recharge with, with its minerals. And this is a little sketch of this area. Uh, how uh, the landscape architects, this is Matthew Thompson, who is the designer on this project who sent me this, um, how they are envisioning this at the end. And just some details just to show you how complex, it looks simple when you go out, but there's many layers and they all have different functions. So it's a huge complex engineering task to actually develop this. By that I want to show you, it looks simple when you see it, but it's actually much more complex. Green roofs, particularly are the most complex in my field, the best paid and the reason is not because it's hard work, but it's obviously so complex to design, and the liabilities are very high if you do mistakes. So um, that's the reason why it has to be um, thought through thoroughly. And finally, as a conclusion, uh, I just wanted to say a few things to these points, and then I will leave you to go back into the beautiful, warm climate. Talking about climate, this is the key thing when you employ these sustainable systems, and you can see the roof failure, uh, the wall failure here on the top. If you are not familiar with what plants grow where and with the climate, then obviously you have problems. So the people who get involved in this really need to understand the climate, and uh, particularly also the evapotranspiration of the plants when they use them in what climate. Because the plant on a green roof, the heat is up to 80 degrees Celsius. Now today will be up there, it's about 80 degrees, so it's like a frying pan. So we really need to think about these things. Then the plant selection, and then obviously when we irrigate, you need to think about, yes, irrigation, yes, cistern, yes, but the pump, which then irrigates, the, you know, which you use to actually move the water, needs to be solar driven. Otherwise, it's not sustainable, from my point of view. And then uh, on that same goes, you need to think about the rainwater and the stormwater management. Where does it apply? What system works best? Is it the green wall or the green roof or the green wall and the green roof or the green roof and the ground level? So this combination needs to be worked out. All these systems always need a backup system. As fantastic all these systems are, you need to have, like when you have a, your sink, you always have a second hole in there, so just in case something floods, the other system functions. So you do still need the conventional sewage system as a backup system. And then I talked about the renewable application solar systems. And one thing we shouldn't forget, and this is a really good example here at the Beattie Museum, is the um, introduction of a public space. So it's not just a technical thing. You can all use it out there in the green that green roof is actually a plaza. So people, when the students come back in the next two weeks, they use it for studying or meeting, and you and the people now are using it in the summer for summer events. So I, I leave you to it with this, and thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take any. If, 
I won't be insulted if you want to just go out and enjoy the sun. It's totally okay. But if any of you has any questions, I'm happy.